Welcome to Behavior Groups, the podcast that brings behavioral science to life. I'm Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. We like to talk to smart, interesting people in order to bring you insights on how behavioral science can improve your life. But before we get into this episode, can we just talk a little bit about brain shift some more? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I, I think we can. And and just a quick reminder to our listeners that my team and I have developed out a 13-week guided journal that was built using a whole bunch of behavioral science principles to help you, our listeners, and anybody else that gets this book to help them achieve their goals. And it's available for sale right now, and it makes a great Christmas or Hanukkah gift. And there's a link in the show notes to buy it. Uh, I've been able to see the progression of this over the past year, and I have to say, it is really impressive work, and I think it's going to make great gifts, and it's going to be a really great gift to yourself if you want to take advantage of it. Oh, man, thanks. That means a lot coming from you. <laughs> well, I know that it was created mostly by your talented team, of course, so it's going to be great. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> oh, yeah. So if I would have been doing most of the work on this, you wouldn't have been saying that, but because my team of really gifted people did. I get it. I get it. No, yeah. no that's that's okay. All I'm right. glad you yeah. picked up on that. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. okay. <laughs> on to our guest for this week. Erez Yoeli is an MIT professor, and he is the co-author of Hidden Games, The Surprising Power of Game Theory to Explain Irrational Human Behavior. In Hidden Games, he explores how game theory can bridge the divide between the rationality of classical economics and the irrationality of behavioral science. And we talked about a lot of great ideas, game theory and how it can be used to examine why Brits drive on the left and Americans drive on the right to determining which TV show gets watched tonight when you're sitting there with your significant other uh, due to why there is gender uh, parity ratio that's typically around 50-50 uh, to why constant firing of rockets between Israel and Palestine might actually prevent a larger war. Yeah, it's kind of pretty crazy when you think about all of the things that he's applying, uh, you know, uh, game theory to. It really is. And this is a conversation that takes us down some wonderful rabbit holes. And we think you're going to really enjoy that. So with that. We ask you to sit back and enjoy your Prisoner's Dilemma cocktail and listen to our conversation <laughs> with Erez Yoeli. Erez Yoeli, welcome to Behavioral Grooves. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We are very, very happy to have you. And we're going to start with some simple questions here. Uh, this should be an easy one. On a hot day, which drink do you prefer? A grapefruit bitters or a Patagonia beer? Oh, man. Patagonia beer. Nobody's asked me about that beer in years. <laughs> <laughs> well, it has to win, although a grapefruit bitters is an excellent choice, too. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, there's a there's an. Uh, so Patagonia beer is that uh, I, I am unfamiliar. So you're going to have to explain that. A is it just a, does a brand or is it from the Patagonia region is just in general? This might be uh, too much of a deep dive, which is a tendency I tend to have. But a Patagonia beer, from what I can tell, is a Vienna style lager, which means it's a slightly darker lager. Oh, I love which those. Which tastes nothing like any other Vienna style lager I've ever had. And it's lovely. <sighs> and there is another uh, Vienna style lager that I can recommend to lovers of Vienna style lagers, which is uh, Israel's Gold Star beer, which also tastes nothing like any other Vienna style lager I've ever had and is lovely. <laughs> so in other words, we need a Vienna style beer that doesn't taste like a Vienna style beer to be a good beer. There's that. that. <laughs> oh, well, there are great Vienna style lagers that taste like them, too. <laughs> Okay. Okay. We're, we'll move on. Oh, this is a speed round. We we often get our speed rounds don't always be aren't very speedy, speedy. In, in many times. So, who would you rather have dinner with? Your favorite actor or your favorite musician? Musician. Oh, that was quick. Is there a person person coming to mind? There wasn't, but if I had to choose, it would probably be um, Haydn. Oh, yeah, Joseph Haydn. Fantastic. Yeah. Wow. Water music, all that fine stuff. Yeah. Okay. Real innovator. Uh, truly, truly. And he was hanging around a bunch of innovators, too, in those days. That's right. You know, that that was a pretty creative community. All right. We could um, we'll come back to that later. Um, who's better at keeping a code of conduct, a government or pirates? Pirates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll talk about that, too. That was part yes. of this book. All right. And then, then the last uh, speed round question again. 
Are scientists immune from generating confirmatory evidence? Heck no. <laughs> Well, well, which just gets into gets into you know some of the the insights from your book that we're going to talk about here. But uh, just with that, uh, we're talking about hidden games, uh, the surprising power of game theory to explain irrational human behavior. Uh, and I just want to start with uh, asking you for the listeners out there who may not know what game theory is. Can you do a succinct kind of? And I know this isn't unnecessarily a succinct topic, but Game theory in general, just a big picture overview of what that is. Absolutely. Uh, it's a math toolkit designed to model strategic interactions, meaning situations where what is optimal for me to do depends on what you do, and what's optimal for you to do depends on what I do. And it's kind of recursive, and you don't really know, okay, well, you know, should I do this? Well, it depends on what he does. Well, what should he do? It depends on what I do. And, <laughs> and you kind of get stuck in this recursive logic. Game theory is a toolkit that developed to help people get around that and to solve those kinds of situations. I'll give you concretely what a game looks like, because it's actually very, very straightforward to just see the most, the simplest kinds of games. Yeah. Um, they usually have three parts. There's players, which you know, oftentimes there's just two players, player one and player two, but you couldn't make it more complicated. Um, those players choose to take certain actions. Um, so there's some set of actions that, that is defined for each player that they can choose from. Uh, in the most famous game, for instance, this is the prisoner's dilemma. This would be, I can choose to either cooperate with my partner or defect and you know, cooperation. Then that the leads us to the third part of the game, which is there are payoffs. And the key part of this is that the, the payoffs have a feature that they depend not only on what I choose, whether I cooperate, but also on what the other person does. And, you know, for the prisoner's dilemma, typically we say that there is some cost to cooperation to the individual, but a benefit to the other player. Yeah. So this can be pretty broad. Is there some kind of a litmus test that sort of says we can apply game theory to this situation or this is a situation that just game theory won't apply? Yeah, I think that you don't often... Uh, you don't need game theory in cases where pe somebody is doing some sort of individual optimization. Mm. The number of apples that I'm going to buy at the market this Sunday, I think that I can probably choose that without too much thinking about what other people are doing, and, and that doesn't really require game theory. But maybe thinking about something like, which TV show am I going to watch? Now that's more social. Like it kind of, it's much more fun to watch a TV show if other people are watching it. That's more of a setting we might use game theory for. That's interesting because again, I, when you think about game theory, at least in, in my mind, when I think about game theory, watching a television show would not be something that I would think about as like applying this logic to. But when you think about it, as you as you talked about it, all right, you and your spouse or your kid or your friend. You have to choose and I might prefer one. They might prefer another. And there might be a third option that we both are kind of like are OK with, but wouldn't necessarily be, you know, the the element. I could see it where I want to watch the science fiction thing. My wife wants to watch the the rom com and we'll settle for something in between because it, it benefits both of us. Is that kind of the way that you would be looking at that? Exactly. In fact, there's even a game that um, folks teach undergrads typically that that exactly characterizes this kind of situation where <laughs> the coordination element is really important even though we might have slightly different preferences over the underlying thing that we're doing yeah. uh, walk us through that if you would the simplest way to do it would be to just model it as a coordination game writ large and in a coordination game we can again have two players you and your spouse they could represent or you know you and a friend um you're going to choose between two actions a and b we'll call them they can be totally abstract you know, those could represent two different TV shows. They could also represent things like what side of the street are we going to drive on, the left side or the right side? <laughs> and and there, you know, you may prefer driving on the left. I may prefer driving on the right. But I really prefer to drive on whatever side you're on much more. <laughs> right? <laughs> and that's the key attribute of a of, um, coordination game is that uh, holding constant what the other player is doing, I prefer to do that same action. So we can write down the payoffs in such a way that characterizes that. And then basically we can solve for the equilibrium of the game and go from there. And that's the point of these uh, exercises for the students is to kind of solve for those equilibria and, and see that there are indeed two stable uh, equilibria. We don't really know which one ex ante will be in and so on and so forth. And, and when you're doing this, and this is part of the, of the book, I think, that uh, was very interesting for me, is this idea that when we're looking at behavior and we see that people, all right, in the United States, we drive on. The right, right? <laughs> I gotta yeah. actually think about this. Whereas no, I was we... just in England and they drive on the opposite side. And, and so we see that. And, but the idea of using game theory is you can actually understand 
that behavior through the mathematical equations of looking at these from that perspective? Is that where am, am I way off base on some of that? Or is that a general uh, way of, of kind of thinking about what you're talking about in the book? Yeah, no, I think that's good a characterization. I mean, basically, there's there's a lot of situations that are social that are kind of surprising, yeah. kind of surprising features. So, for instance, we talked about the prisoner's dilemma earlier. Mm -hmm. And in that game, the thing that's kind of surprising is that both players would be better off if they cooperate. But like, actually, from an individual standpoint, you're better off shirking and accepting the, the benefits of cooperation without actually paying for the costs of it. And, and it's very good at highlighting that the thing that's good for society isn't necessarily what's good for the individual. Mm -hmm. Or in the, in the game that you're talking about now, the coordination game, the thing that it really highlights is that there are multiple things that could arise that are kind of self-reinforcing. If everybody's driving on the left, I'll drive on the left. And if everybody's driving on the right, I could drive on the right. And, and you know, how do people navigate in situations where there are multiple equilibria like that or and so on and so forth? So it's like really good at zeroing in on these situations where there's something puzzling and it helps us to characterize that situation very cleanly, highlight the puzzle and maybe highlight the, the explanation for the puzzle. I, I want to go back to this uh, prisoner's dilemma. You brought up this idea of defecting as being uh, good for the individual. Can you walk us through that? Because, you know, when, when I think about all of, so much of the research on prisoner's dilemma indicates that we want to punish people for defecting because of this social norm that we have with, you know, of cooperation or fairness, right? If there's not fairness, then if you're not being fair, I'm going to punish you in some way. But how does it actually benefit me to defect? So start with the very simple situation where the two players interact just once. This yeah. is called the one-shot prisoner's dilemma. Yeah. And what this game, this game is, I think, not very realistic because it's very rare that people only interact once and that nobody else would ever be watching and that that wouldn't influence their reputation or something like that, right? And so this game is very artificial. But... In that situation, let's pretend we are somehow in it, even though it's not realistic. In that situation, there's nothing like a future punishment that could induce that good behavior. All there is is these two players facing this decision, one of which is more costly than the other. And the player says, regardless of what the other guy does, I'm better off not paying that cost. It doesn't influence how he's going to treat me. You know, that's a given. All all I can uh, affect is whether I pay the cost or not, and I'm better off uh, not paying the cost. And what it's really doing is highlighting the, the key puzzle of cooperation. It doesn't give us the solution yet. It highlights the puzzle, which is we're asking people to pay a cost for the benefit of others. And by itself, it's not clear why they would do that. We need to add more in order to explain why they would do that. Yeah. Does that, does that happen then in multiple iterations? Exactly. So the, the most common solution to this that people talk about, the one that people tend to focus on most, is this idea that, that well, you know, we don't interact in a vacuum. We tend to interact multiple times with the same individuals, and we tend to interact with, you know, even if we don't interact with that individual, again, other people watch us interact, and so on and so forth. So what they do is they complicate the model, and the key complication is that they make it repeat. There's some probability delta that's between zero and one that you play the game again. Right. And then, you know, there's another probability delta to play the game and it just infinitely repeats with some probability you play it again, some probability it ends. Yeah. And I find it fascinating when we when you put that in and you think about the, the behaviors that are a subsequent result of that, that you can, as you said, characterize the behavior that we see in real life, which is a really interesting piece of this. And you talk about a number of other games in the book. You talked about the coordinating, you know, different pieces, but you also have Grim Trigger, ALD. What, what are some of, uh, do you have a favorite or is it just based upon the circumstances <laughs> that you find yourself in? Is one just kind of so much like you go, ah, this is the one that I really like to use. I mean, we purpose build the games for the social phenomena. So like yeah. in some sense, the favorite, like the answer I should give is <laughs> <laughs> my favorite is the right one for the setting. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> but of course, like there are some chapters that you really have like a warm spot for. I think, um, I think the chapter on categorical norms, I, I just think it's so, it's such an elegant and counterintuitive. It's a counterintuitive result. It really highlights the power of game theory. You, you can write down the model and explain it very simply, but at the same time, it's like getting you something that nobody's, even very good economists or, or mathematicians, they're like, oh, oh yeah, I didn't think of that. Yeah. 
Whereas a lot of models exposed, they're kind of obvious what the results are. But here, here, it really like, it's very puzzling. It was interesting because I, I found that chapter fascinating myself, right? And the initial story about Roosevelt uh, and refusing I, to use Iwo chemical Jima, weapons yeah. in Iwo right. Jima was, I thought it was just a perfect way to kind of encapsulate that that whole piece. So could you kind of a talk, talk a little bit about that story uh, and, and then explain a little bit what categorical norms are and how they're used? Yeah. Absolutely. So categorical norms is our way of like basically pointing out that norms are often conditioned on categorical variables instead of um, the more continuous ones you might think would matter. And I'll give some concrete examples uh, uh, of what that means. So for instance, we condition on whether or not you use a chemical weapon or a nuclear weapon, which is a category of weapon, when probably the reason these norms arose is because they were designed to prevent lots of death and suffering. But we could have just conditioned the norm on those things, right? Why not mm-hmm. Why not just make it so that there's a norm against causing needless casualties? And if you, if you uh, create more than a certain number of casualties, then, you know, you, the international community comes and sanctions you and blah, blah, blah. But we don't do that. Instead, we, we have a norm against chemical weapons. Another example is around uh, human rights. So we condition on the category of species membership. Are you or are you not a member of, of Homo sapien? And you might think again that like what we should be doing is conditioning on how intelligent or sentient or you know, the ability to feel pain. And we don't really do that. It means that sometimes we give more rights to you know infants or to comatose people than we do to a very intelligent chimpanzee or a very intelligent whale or dolphin. And that's somewhat ironic. And so the idea here is to point out that that a lot of times our our sense of morality in general and norms in particular tend to like have this black and white element. You're either in or you're out. You're either you know it's either wrong or it's or it's right. It's it's either this kind of weapon or it's that one. When really you would expect them to be more sensitive to the underlying variable, the amount of harm caused, the the amount of value in this particular situation, and and instead they seem blunter than that. Yeah. So that's the puzzle. Uh, it really is. Uh, and it's it's a fascinating one uh, with the, the human condition. And one of the parts that I loved the most was discussions about uh, the Nash equilibrium in relationship to to uh, gender balance in the population. And uh. so so, uh, <laughs> and so I was trying to explain this to my wife. Uh, long story. Let's let, let's go back to can you ex- first explain the Nash equilibrium and why it's important? Uh, and then how does that get manifest in our in our biology, in the, in the way that we have uh, boys and girls? Well, and, and let me just preface this because Tim tried to explain this to his wife and he <laughs> couldn't after the first question that she asked. He's like, I, I, I don't know. So I think he's asking this so that he can go back to his wife and feel smart. So there you go. OK, honestly. <laughs> All right. There you go. Let's see if I can do it. Uh, <laughs> So the, let's start again with the puzzle. Uh, the puzzle is that if you look across species, most species, there is a 50-50 sex ratio uh, between men and women, a one-to-one ratio, uh, roughly speaking, and this is counted at birth. Yeah. And uh, this can be true for for elephant seals. It can be true for uh, uh, various moths. You know, like it, it doesn't matter where you look. Uh, um, yeah. Sea turtles, humans, it, it, we see this one-to-one ratio. Darwin had noticed this, and in fact, he includes a long discussion of this in uh, the first edition of The Descent of Man, uh, including tables of counts of different um, for different kinds of butterflies that all his buddies had sent him from all over England. It's really cute, uh, but it was a puzzle that that they was already they were already aware of back then, and they didn't really have a solution to yet. The solution comes in the 1930s. Although I'll come back to that point, it's kind of an interesting history here. But roughly speaking, to get at the, the core question here, which is how do you use Nash equilibrium to solve this? Roughly speaking, what we can think of is as, as parents choosing the gender of their offspring. Of course, they don't do this. The, the evolution does it for them, but we'll come back to that. For now, presume that the parents can somehow choose the gender of their offspring. And imagine what happens if you're in a population where there's really a lot of one gender. Maybe there are lots and lots of um, females and, and there's only like a handful of males. Now, in, if you imagine for simplicity that the population isn't really growing, this doesn't end up influencing the analysis, then say there's 100 individuals in the population now and there's 100 in the next population and there's there's only uh, five 
uh, males, well, then how many offspring would, on average, each male have? They'd have 20, right? Am I doing the math yep, right? Yep. 20, 20 offspring per male. Yeah. Whereas for females, the number of offspring per females is, what, 95 over 100 or something? Yeah. A little less than one. Yeah. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so it's a lot. If you're going to choose and, and you're trying to maximize your fitness over time, you're much better off choosing the male. And, and so what you would do is you would choose the male. And um, again, then, this oh, is this is in this hypothetical world right. where we get to choose the gender of our offspring. That's right. And then yeah. over time, that would equalize until you got to one. And you could have done this in the other direction, too. You could have started with too many males and, and very few females, and you would have just gone in the other direction towards one. And you, the key thing that you have to check is that at one, well, what happens? <laughs> at one, this is the Nash equilibrium. This is the proposed Nash equilibrium. And, and the key definition of a Nash equilibrium is this is a uh, strategy set in this game that no one can benefit from deviating unilaterally from. Holding constant what the others are doing, I can't benefit by deviating. And that's true for every player in the game. So if we take a player in this population, can they benefit by deviating from whatever offspring that they were going to choose? No, because everybody's having exactly two offspring, right? Yeah. So if I choose males, I get two. If I choose females, I get two. It doesn't matter. I can't benefit by deviating. So that's the only Nash equilibrium of the game when you write it down this way. Now, the core problem is the one you guys are alluding to, which is you can't actually choose the offspring. Right, right. But the good news is that evolution has ways of doing this for you. So it really varies across different species. And I'm not, by no means an expert on this, but there's a nice literature looking into how the mechanisms by which um, different species moderate uh, the number of off the number of female to male, the ratio of female to male offspring, the sex ratio. And in humans, for instance, it's through uh, sex selective abortion. Effectively, there are many fetuses that mo don't make it to uh, uh, being born, probably about two thirds, we think. And the, the likelihood of a male surviving can be lower than a female. And there's all sorts of interesting things around that. But like one thing you can do is if, if they are in an environment, hypothetically speaking, where it would be beneficial to have males, that could, that could change individuals who evolved to be somewhat less selective about the male fetuses that they uh, allow to come to term. Those individuals would have more offspring. That gene would spread, mm -hmm. and that would start to drive the population towards one to one. And so, evolution has these ways of finding these strategies, even if the parents themselves don't have uh, these ways. Yeah, it's fascinating when you think about that, and you kind of look even. Um, and, and this obviously isn't a, a direct kind of relationship, but you look at the the China one child policy. And then the the selective abortions that they were able to make in various different pieces of that with the additional of like males being higher in that population than females. And now you look at the what has happened within that and you can, can see where, yeah, the powers that would be pushing that back to equilibrium are probably taking shape. And, um, you know, that that's an interesting piece as you look at that over a course of time, uh, even in a, in a in a real world kind of situation where. That isn't a natural occurring thing, but it was happened by by policy from from a government. So, yeah, I I agree. There, there's obviously humans are complicated. Uh, they have all sorts of cultural things that get in the way of exactly fifty fifty, and that's part of what's going on there. Yeah. Um, but even there, you see some of this push back towards fifty fifty. Yeah. Uh, we recently spoke with Max Bazerman about his book, Complicit. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to see it, but he's he's definitely in the behavioral science camp, right? Uh, yes. Uh, and, a, but he, a founder of the camp. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very much, very much so. Um, uh, but he talks about omission and commission, uh, these different acts and how they, they influence. And of course, his his thesis in, in Complicit is this idea that that we've spent too much time focusing on the commission and and not enough time sort of focusing on the omission like where we're where we're not we, we you know in the trolley study we didn't we didn't push the guy off the bridge so i you know it wasn't my fault so, you know somebody else did that um how do, how do, how does this uh but omission and commission play a role in game theory can you tell us about that absolutely so we do we also have a um part of a chapter that focuses on the emission commission distinction. Um, and in fact, we've talked to Max uh, about oh. this particular puzzle um, in actually after our book talk. It was a, a fun discussion. And we might be asking, there, there are sort of multiple reasons why. The, so first of all, let's define the emission commission distinction. Um, and then and then we'll, we'll launch Great. into to where it comes from. Um, 
So the omission commission distinction is basically this this puzzling feature of our sense of morality, whereby we seem to be more um, willing to punish transgressions where somebody has acted than ones that are otherwise equivalent, and the person has taken no action. And a very clear way to show this is using these trolley-like problems, where um, you know a, tro- a trolley is barreling down the uh, the um, tracks out of control and it is approaching a T intersection and on one of the tracks sits the car of the you know person in the control room who can pull a lever and on the other track there's a workman and he has to choose which track it's going to go. It's going to hit the workman or it's going to hit his, car, his brand new car and ruin it. And all you need to do is take that lever and change the default and you get either an omission or a commission, right? Yeah. If he, if he does nothing in one, if the lever is one way, if he does nothing, it hits his car. If he does nothing in the other way, it hits the uh, workman. And in one case, if he, if he pushes the lever and actually causes the trolley to hit the, the workman, that's a commission. Whereas if in the other case, if he does nothing and lets the trolley go, uh, uh, Un, unfettered, then it hits the workman. And what you find there is the subjects report that one is much worse than the other. The commission is much worse. Um, so that's the puzzle. It's kind of weird. Like basically, we 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 make it so it's very clear he 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 was aware of the situation. He could have done something about it, and yet people still have the intuition that it's less bad. And there's there's been various replications. You'd think like what would matter is did this guy like allow the guy to die, and, and yet and yet we're somewhat more permissive of it if it's done via action than inaction. So that's the puzzle. There are a few uh, explanations for this that are floating around. Most of them have some social element. Um, some of them are cognitive. So some of them are like you know omissions are just harder to process. And I think Max actually tends to to buy into that uh, explanation a fair amount. And I do too. I think that there's something to that. But there's also some uh, more social explanations, like, for instance, there is some element of coordination involved in these uh, in uh, moral judgments. Uh, I, I want to punish you for transgressions if others agree, and if they don't really agree with me, then I kind of look bad for punishing you wrongly. And if I know, uh, that makes it hard to take into account certain kinds of information into wh- whether or not I punish, in particular intentions, which is something that like, I may know, I may know this guy could have pulled the lever. I may know, I, I saw him looking at the trolley and stuff like that, but that that's not like something that is shared information. And so it's harder for, for uh, norms and, and morality more broadly to take that kind of information into account. And that's the kind of uh, explanation we focus on in our book. Yeah, it's interesting. And it, before we got on, on air, you were talking about the difference in how you look at behavioral science and maybe how we kind of think of behavioral science. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think this is an interesting kind of collaboration where you kind of look at this from a different, maybe a different uh, perspective than say Max might in in some of these situations. Yeah. um, A lot of our focus in the book is about, is kind of under the hood. Yeah. So a behavioral scientist will come and say neoclassical preferences that, that you, you found in these various models it turns out humans don't really work that way. And, <laughs> let, and let's let's fix that. Yeah. Let's see what power we can get by fixing that. And in some cases, we get a lot of power. And what we do is say, okay, that's fine. But like, where did that come? Like this weirdness that you guys are introducing into these models, where does that come from? <laughs> and, and so to some extent, we'll be, if we're using an incentives-based approach and game theory in particular to try to understand that, we're not taking a preference for an omission as given. You know, an economist might say, oh, you know, in the utility function, you would put in whether this was a commission or an omission. And, and you know, depending on which one it was, that you would it would have different utility function and so on. And we would ask, wait, wait, wait where does that utility function come from? Why is that something that, that ended up being so common? Mm, I love that. One of the chapters that you talk about, you talk about motivated reasoning. And, um, which is a really fascinating piece, at least in, in, in my perspective, and we see it uh, across the board. But you talk about how internalized persuasion impacts us. So first, can you talk a little bit about that, uh, the, the, the internalizing component of this, and then what you kind of find from your, your kind of view on uh, motivated reasoning? Absolutely. So this is, I mean, this sets perfectly from the last topic too, right? Like behavioral scientists often think of motivated reasoning as 
there's just this like weird machinery in our minds that's not good at stats. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and here are various ways that it's not good at stats. And and we're done. Um, we're going to take those as given. We're going to we're going to apply those to our models. And, and that's good. And we, again, are asking, wait a minute, but why these particular quirks? Is there is it just that like some of this is harder than than other stuff? Or And so we, we're not good at the hard stuff. But it doesn't really look that way. Like, for instance, we're very good at incorporating exactly the same evidence if it's in our favor, but not if it's not in our favor. And and cleverly designed experiments can show this. Can, they can show that like controlling for how difficult it is to do something, really it's whether something is in the person's favor that, that's um, determining whether the person starts to believe it or not. There's work by Michael Thaler. If you haven't encountered his work, it's fantastic. Uh, that, that does this very cleanly. But um, uh, and and a few others, of course. He's not the only one. And so that's uh, that's the the distinction here. And and what we have done is basically taken as given a explanation that was proposed not by us but by uh, Bob Trivers, Bill von Hippel, a handful of others who are coming in from the more bio or evolutionary psych perspective. And they're saying, to some extent, one of the functions of reasoning is persuading others of stuff. Uh, I'm a good uh, mate, I'm a good uh, friend, I'm a good colleague uh, in an interview setting, in a date setting, in, a, in you know, an introduction. And if that's the case, then maybe to some extent, the reason we believe stuff isn't just so that we have a model of the truth, but it is actually so that we are better at persuading people. And in some cases, having a model of the truth is really important. If the stove is hot and I have a bad model of whether the stove is hot, that's going to suck. Right, right. When it comes to climate change, having a bad model of the truth, maybe you buy a house on lower ground than you might have, you maybe should have or something like that. But like the, the implications for me personally of holding a wrong belief actually are fairly weak. And so what Trivers and, and his uh, cohort of, uh, of folks point out is that in those cases, there's a lot of room to have false beliefs. And in particular, the beliefs that would make one better at persuading others. And, and so what they propose is that people internalize beliefs in those contexts, and particularly beliefs that will make it harder for people to uncover bad stuff about us. And you can see where this is going. If you, if you know, we're good at lie detection. We can tell when somebody in front of us is holding back, not telling the whole story and stuff like that. But if you yourself don't believe something, then now it's a lot harder to extract that information from you. And so what they basically propose is, is that beliefs have this feature, especially in persuasion settings. And then we take that and we say, okay, well, if that's the case, let's write some simple games that help us understand some of these features of, of motivated reasoning a little better. You talked about uh, the Hatfields and McCoys, which is a, a story that I've just been a fan of for a long time. This wonderful American saga of, of two families fighting back and forth. But then your you, definition you, of wonderful is a little bit strange. well. <laughs> that is a given. Uh, his his definition on many things is a bit strange. So we'll just great, we'll go with that. It's great folklore, you know. I mean, it really, uh, it really is. But uh, but you you kind of bring that forward, like when you talked about the Palestinian and Israeli conflict, and and you. And you, you wrote that um, trading rocket fire is a necessary part of maintaining peace. Yeah. And, and, and I love that, actually. I, I love that because I, I, I think it's, fan, it's a really cool insight. But can you tell us why, why you guys wrote that, why, why you believe that to be the case, and why game theory supports this idea that, um, that this needs to happen? And then the follow-up is, how does that apply to Ukraine and Russia? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So... The good news is humans are good at cooperation. Yeah. And we were talking about the prisoner's dilemma before. We talked about kind of how one might solve that dilemma, that one does that through these repeated interactions. And basically, if if I were to summarize in a sentence how how these solutions tend to look, uh, I would say there's the shadow of the future, the, the threat of punishment that's uh, holding people in line, that that's motivating them to cooperate. The, the, now, the pirates, the pirates, basically, right? Yeah, the, the pirates, they, they also do this, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and and so, you know, in an environment like uh, with the Hatfield and McCoys, which is an environment without very strong formal institutions, in an environment like Israel-Palestine, where you don't have a third party that can just come in and, like, put, lay down the law, then yeah. the, the way that instead cooperation ends up happening is through this this tit for tat kind of environment where I um, I'm good to you now, and if I'm good to you now, you're more likely to be good to me in the future, and that sustains peace. But there's 
that's and that's something that that that's something that's an insight that's been around since the 1970s. It's not it's not a new insight. We cover it in the book and whatever. But there's an additional insight, which is a slightly newer insight, and, and I'll credit Robert Amon for at least introducing me to this insight. He's a um, Nobel laureate from Israel in game theory, and he, um, in his Nobel Prize speech, talks about how you have to simultaneously be cooperative but also be firm, and the importance of of punishing when you are wrong. And what he points out is that that punishment is very much like the decision of whether or not to cooperate. It has some cost to it a lot of the time, um, just like the decision to cooperate does. And so how do you get people to be motivated to do it? Well, there must be down the road some implications to not doing it. So even though it's costly now to punish, it must be the case that if you don't punish in equilibrium, you get punished worse in some way. You get exploited in some way. And so what we sometimes say is, Cooperation is supported by punishment. Punishment is supported by exploitation down the line. Mm. And let's bring this to the actual examples on the table. So in the Hatfield and McCoy's case, what you see is a lot of weird escalation of the conflict. That, that people go in and they, they do an action like uh, whacking one of the guys from the other clan when you know they're going to get whacked for it themselves. <laughs> and it's like, there's no way they're going to get around this. And you're like, why are you doing this? This is crazy. But if you think about it, it from the standpoint that I just described, it's like, well, they were wronged. And, and in order, if they don't do this, it will presumably be worse for them. So they have to pay this cost. The most famous example of this from that story, I just have to tell this, is after the, the real point at which this escalates into a feud is when in a drunken brawl during an election, some of the McCoys killed a, a Hatfield. And in response, the head of the Hatfield clan, whose name is Lovely, it's Devil Ants. Um, <laughs> a perfect name, again. I know. It's perfect, yeah. So Devil Ants uh, decides that he is going to avenge this wrong. But the amazing thing is that in order to avenge this wrong, he actually has to kidnap the McCoys who have already been arrested from law enforcement. They are already going to be hung for this trial, right. for this for this crime. But it's not good enough for ants, for devil no, ants. No, he yeah. has to do it. Yeah. And so he know, you can see like what he is doing is putting himself in, in harm's way. He's going to achieve nothing from it. The outcome is going to be the same for the McCoy brothers. And, and so it's really remarkable that, that he's like sending the signal, I cannot be trod on. Um, and it kind of helps to clarify that he's willing to pay that cost. And, and, you know, presumably that's because in equilibrium, if he does not do that, others will exploit him further. Mm. And there's a presume, I think a lot of what's going on when you look at the Palestinian Israeli conflict, when there are these flare ups is to me very clarifying to see this individual action where say Hamas decide, threatens to throw rockets and then over some symbolic infraction by the Israelis. And it's very clear what they're doing is saying, listen, like, we know this is going to hurt, but we got to do it. Like, we've got to tell you guys you can't cross that line in some way. And, and so I think that that's what's, uh, uh, that, that's what this model is adding is that it's showing that, that sometimes you have to punish even when it hurts. Yeah. yeah. And to bring it to Ukraine, finally, the, the, one of the things that has been going around in the pundit circle and, um, uh, not just in the pundit circle, but, uh, our friend Elon Musk has decided to weigh in on this question is that maybe we should let, shooting off the hook and like resolve this situation and there's various ways in which people propose that they you know they say oh you know this is this is the most likely outcome like like musk did you know let's just tell putin he can have it and, and end this thing and that makes sense in this situation if you ignore the future and you say okay like you're right punishing him further than this is really costly there's a risk of nuclear war yeah but at the same time there is something on the table that we're trying to preserve, which is the idea that you can't just invade sovereign nations if you want some of their territory. And if you want to preserve that norm, you may need to risk paying very high costs in order to preserve that norm going forward with Putin and with others. I mean, I actually think that the real audience for this is China yeah. and Taiwan. Yeah. Um, uh, North so, Korea. Or, North uh, Korea. Good. Yeah. yeah. So I think that basically... If what you wanted is to minimize the cost of this uh, particular uh, engagement, then yeah, of course, you say, here, take take whatever these lands it, that you want here. And, and it's not really fair to Ukraine, but but that's going to minimize li lives lost and fine. But if what you're trying to do is is a longer game of preserving world peace, then I think you have uh, a different objective and you're willing to, to pay the cost to punish, even though their risks are very high. 
Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. That was, that was, I, I, again, I love, I love those insights. I love that, that perspective on it because it, it was eye opening for me, uh, coming from a very, uh, pacifist background. Uh, you know, just ugh, let Putin have the damn, you know, territory. Let's just, let's just get this over with. Um, but I think you, you, you show how it, how this paves, how that sort of, uh, compliance paves the way for more and more aggression in the future. Yeah. That's right. Think about Chamberlain and Churchill. Yeah. 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 There that's a go. great example. Oh, OK. Uh, so we're going to switch switch channels here. Uh, you talked about Gregory Sokolov in the book. Fantastic classical pianist. Holy cow. Um, you know, someone to be revered and Big L, the rapper. <laughs> so and then you mentioned James, he you know, Joseph Haydn in the, um, you know, as we were going through the speed round. Uh, I'm just curious as to where your musical tastes lie. If you happen to be put on a desert island for a year. What what two musical artists would you take with you? Two. Yeah. You get their well, entire okay. catalog. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Not just one song. <laughs> well, I'll go back to Haydn. I'm on a Haydn kick right now, and I think that I would not get bored of Haydn ever. Um, and so he's a good person to take with you to the desert island. Okay. Um, he's also a good person to take to the desert island because so many others re reference him that in some sense he would allow you to – fantasize about all the others who have built upon him. Yeah. So we can choose him as our classical artist, but then some of the time you just need something that grooves and is like, you can put it on in the background and it makes you smile and yeah. maybe you don't think about it as hard. I, for them, I, I think I would have to choose Paul Simon. Ah. He's wow. just a great storyteller. Um, his lyrics are beautiful. I don't get tired of, of listening to the, to the beat and the melody and, you know, they're sufficiently complex that, that I, and even today, after many, many years of being a fan, I find new things. And I, w I would say he would be the guy I would choose for my more pop listening. Well, and he has he has a, a large catalog, too. So you're pulling from many, many years of, of really, again, wonderful musical collaborations with Garfield. And, you know, you know um, that's, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you wouldn't get tired of the five songs he did. Yeah. yeah. He's got more than that. Yeah, yeah it's, it's better than K-pop. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I think I think that's fantastic. That's that's a really – and when you said groove, I was not thinking of Paul Simon. But but yet, you know, he he's done it. He he knows how to pull off a, a, a great groove. I mean, Mrs. Robinson, he continues to kind of reinvent that with all sorts of uh, of new grooves and new ways of of approaching that that downbeat. I the think the, grooviest song of his, in my opinion, is Fifty Ways to Leave Your Love." Yeah. Oh, <laughs> with that amazing drum line that's played by, I think it was Steve Gadd. Yeah, it was. That was Steve Gadd. Absolutely, it was. Oh, yes. So good. Yeah. 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 What, what do they say? You know, when, when you need a good drummer, you know, fine, you know, it, you know, just go down the list, you know, Russ Conkle, blah, blah, blah. But when you need a great drummer, call Steve Gadd. <laughs> and, and Paul Simon knew it. He worked with him for, for decades. Yeah. See, yeah, see this fantastic. is where Tim geeks out and loses me. When you guys start talking <laughs> about the drummers on, on this album and this kind of, you know, this situation, yeah. but, but yeah, or, or, Tim has also talked about, you know, th that concert and they had this drummer in on different pieces. Oh, and, boy. Yeah. So you, you two can geek out. I'll just go sit off in the corner. Well, so. well I've got a, a, I'm cheating because I was a classical percussionist growing up and I, uh, oh. I in fact, went to conservatory and, and um, a semester and dropped out and went to regular school. But um, I was planning on becoming a, a classical musician. And so some of some of this uh, is digging back 20 years to when, when I was still behind a, a set of timpani yeah. well, uh, or a marimba. I got through a full year at the, at the conservatory uh, oh, on, wow. on, on guitar. And then, was, then I thought this isn't actually helping my chops. I thought that it was going to actually broaden my, cause I, in high school, I'd played jazz and folk and rock and all. And I thought, well, Classical would be really good to have that formal training. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, yeah, baloney. I, I got totally, <laughs> I, I got totally worn out on Ravel and Beethoven. You know, Bach after like a, a, a couple of months. Uh, well, we'll have to compare notes over a Vienna Lager. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> a, 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 uh, yeah, Patagonia Vienna Lager. Uh, there, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for being a guest on Behavioral Grooves. Thank you, guys.
Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I groove on what we learned from our discussion with Erez, have a free-flowing conversation, and talk about whatever else comes into our hidden game brain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This was kind of a... The hidden games that we yeah. are playing in our brains. I think that's that's a good one, right? So how many times was your mind blown in this conversation <laughs> and in reading the book? I think my... my Oh my God. It's the intelligence level oh, of Arez yeah. is like three standard deviations above mine. Yeah, so yeah, there you go. He's way yeah. out there. Uh, should we start with just for those who listen to the conversation and may still just be wondering a little bit about exactly what, uh, what game theory is? Can we spend just, just, a, <laughs> just a minute on that? Would that be okay? So you're talking to me, huh? Yeah. Is that, cause I, I still am kind of wondering what, what is game theory? So I looked this up, right? I looked it up on Wikipedia where they said the study of mathematical models of strategic interactions among rational agents. Okay. Uh, what the hell does that mean? Right. I was going to say something other than hell there, but you know, um, but I did like uh, a better explanation was in Britannica where, you know, they were talking about, again, some of the stuff, a branch of applied mathematics that provides tools for analyzing situations in which parties called players make decisions that are independent and interdependence causes each player to consider the other players, possible decisions or strategies and formulate strategy, blah, blah, blah. But they get further because they talk about um, where this was introduced, which was the theory of games and economic behavior ah. from von Neumann and Morganson from 1944. This yeah, was done yeah. way back then yeah. and where they where they were looking at this and saying, look, the math that we use for physical sciences doesn't really it's a poor math to be using when we think about economics where there are people because right. you know physical sciences is disinterested there's nothing going on right you don't have acting agents and what they said and i quote here from the britannica is they observed that economics is much like a game wherein players anticipate each other's moves and therefore it requires a new kind of mathematics which they called game theory Bing. and the name yeah Bing. isn't that great yeah yeah and i love this i love this yeah. little part that they put in and the name may be somewhat of a misnomer game theory generally does not share the fun and frivolity of associated with games. <laughs> no no it's not, i love that part it's, that was what i'm going oh yep the britannica nailed it yeah. there you go it's not fun and frivolous no <laughs> not not really and especially with some of the uh some of the examples that that Erez and his co-author used are pretty intense stuff but Wow, just fantastic. Like literally mind blowing for me. It, it was. And and the the math behind this isn't frivolous. It's really it's hardcore. Yep. And but what's really cool is that, you know, as 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 the book kind of overviews, but what Erez was talking about too is the the ways that game theory can be applied across all these different domains is just pretty mind-boggling really. when you think about it. Uh, it. It is truly. And for me, like the, the, the conversation just really got out of hand in a, the most wonderful way when we were talking about the Hatfields and McCoys and that led us into the Palestinian and Israeli conflict and we touched on Russia and Ukraine. But this whole idea that actually keeping the peace or, or, or at least uh, keeping the the disruption between Palestine and and Israel sort of to a a low roar actually works better when there is sort of a regular exchange of of fire and that just blows me away and yet it totally makes sense now so i'm really really glad that we had that that conversation so i could see why do they keep doing it why do they keep doing it well they have to they actually have to do that in order to to kind of keep that exchange going to so that one side doesn't doesn't just say all right i'm done and then the other guys say oh they stopped so now we can just pretty much overrun them and yeah. so they have to kind of keep this exchange going in order to avoid the bigger war. And I, I think that that that, again, was kind of mind blowing for me. It is. It is. I mean, that was one of those things that, again, counterintuitive, mm -hmm. but makes sense after you think about it. Totally. And the, the, the way that uh, Erez was applying game theory to this, this idea of, all right, we have to take the other person's thoughts into mind. The other piece that blew me away was this whole categorical norms, this idea of Franklin Roosevelt, who, uh, 
you know, all of his generals wanted to use, uh, uh, you know, chemical, uh, chemical weapons, weapons yeah. in, in Iwo Jima and it got all the way up there. And he said no, um, even though even though it probably would have saved lives in the end, particularly American lives on this. But this idea that there are these categorical norms that are just, you know, they're go no go types of things. They're morality pieces. They're these like using nuclear weapons, using chemical weapons, et cetera. And in reality, when you think about it, there probably there, there could be a sliding scale on these. Like we don't use chemical weapons until we get to the point where actually using chemical weapons will save people's lives uh, in the long run, in the bigger picture. But we don't do that. Similar to what we just talked about with the Hatfield and McCoys, you know, this is really Palestinian because that could lend itself to a slippery slope. Right. And then. Right. You're going to be all right. Well, then anybody can start using these in various different pieces. So what what makes all that work is when we sort of have these norms is when we agree yeah. on these norms and we all kind of buy into them. And in recent years, our political norms have changed dramatically. Right. What's what it's you know, the sort of the what's on limits and what's off limits. <laughs> So what what we expect out of that is just out the out the window. It's just totally yeah. Those totally norms gone. have been destroyed. I mean, Truly. to to a certain degree, and that yep. within the past, granted twenty years, but a lot at least in America within the past since the whole Donald Trump era, yeah. and he just blew those out of the water. They might have been they might have been kind of deteriorating before that. Yes, and he took a sledgehammer to them. So absolutely, um, yeah. And and now it seems like it's it's free game to say whatever you want, do whatever you can, you know, disparage your opponent in any any manner which is possible. And and it gets back to this thing like, so can you be the person that goes back and says, No, I'm not going to go over that line when your opposition is just blown past it. Not really. Because yeah. all of a sudden you get ramrodded and you lose yeah. and you know, that those are just it's scary when you think yeah. about that. There there are reasons why we have categorical norms and, and that's one of them. So Ab absolutely. Yeah. So are you uh are, are you have you found yourself just using game theory in your everyday discussions, Kurt? I haven't, but I know you have. I mean, you brought this up in, in London after from reading the book with people. And so I how do. are you using it? Well, I, I again, I just think I'm just trying to apply this fantastic thought leadership uh, that comes from uh, the book and uh, Erez's work. And I just think that we need to just think about this idea that there are mathematical ways that that I'm not super familiar with. There are mathematical ways of describing and identifying things that happen when there are more when there's multiple parties involved. That uh, that when we can look at something like um, like our gender parity, you know, and actually find that there is good reason to have roughly the same number of males as there are females in any population. That that we. We work these things out, and that's I, th I think it's fascinating, and it's a good reminder for me to have uh, at work. I, I, you know, not a lot of applications for it for for me in my daily life, but it's but just having that in the back of my mind kind of keeps me. It just keeps me on my toes, and I and I really like that. Uh, uh, okay, yeah. I think I think we can end <laughs> okay. there because my head is going to explode oh. a from the whole episode and everything else yeah it is pretty heady stuff i i, I agree <laughs> yeah well listeners we hope that you were educated and hopefully a little bit entertained by this discussion and that it makes you think how can i look through the world like tim does as a game theorist now to see how different types of decisions are made when there are different actors involved. Ah, yeah. very nicely said. Ultimately, game theory is about optimizing decisions when you have two or more people involved. And we just need to think about how they're going to impact our decision making. That's that's kind of the important thing. I think that is the best explanation so far. Damn it, Tim. That was good. I've been working on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So listeners, please go out and play some games this week and go find your group.